Hello again, my dear friends, and welcome to Original Strange Fairy Tales and Other Stories. I am glad that you are here. Today I have a special story for you, and I must say that it was not easy to find, and I also had to translate it into modern English myself. This is a story written sometime in the 1100s, and although I am sure that you have heard of it before, I am not so sure that you have actually been told this story in its original form. I hope that you, dear listener, will enjoy this story as much as I have. So, without further delay, from Prose Merlin by Robert de Boron, I now proudly present to you the first ever written account of Arthur and the Sword in the Stone. Enjoy. When he came before them, they said, Merlin, we know well that you are wise and have always loved the kings of this realm. And you know well that this land is left without an heir, and a land without a lord avails little. Therefore, we pray and request you to help us choose a man who could govern the realm for the benefit of the people and the salvation of Holy Church. And Merlin said, I am not such a man who should involve himself in such counsel, nor should I choose a man to be a governor. But if you agree to my decision, I shall tell you, and if I do not speak well, do not agree to it. And they said, All for the welfare and benefit of us all, may our Lord send grace. And Merlin said, I have greatly loved this realm and the people therein, and if I were to tell you whom you should make your king, I ought to be believed, and it would be right, but a fair opportunity has befallen you if you wish to know it. The king has now died since Martinmas, and from now until Christmas is but a little time, and if you trust my counsel, I shall give you good and true advice both in the eyes of God and the world. And they all said at once, Say what you will, and we shall hold to it. And he said, you know well that now comes the feast when our Lord was born, and he is Lord of all lords. And I will undertake, if you and all the people commonly pray to our Lord for his great mercy, to send you a rightful governor, as he, through his great humility at this feast called Christmas, was born of a virgin and king of all kings, that he at this feast choose such a man to be your king and lord, that the people may rule and govern to his pleasure, and that he show such a demonstration that the people may see and know that it is by his election, and that he who is so chosen be king without any other election. And know well, if you do this, you shall see the election of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then they all answered with one accord and said, We agree with this counsel, and there is no earthly man who should not agree to it. Then they prayed all bishops and archbishops to command through all the churches that the people pray as you have heard. And all the lords swore to one another to hold to the decision of Holy Church in whatever way God would show them. In this manner they agreed to Merlin's counsel, and Merlin took leave of them, and they prayed him to be with them at Christmas, to see if what he had taught them was true or not. And Merlin said, I shall not be there, for you shall not see me until the election is made. Thus went Merlin to Blas, and told him all these things. Then all the worthy men of the realm of Logris, they came unto Logris at Christmas. Thus was this thing done and awaited until Christmas. And Antor, 
who had nourished this child until he was a man of fifteen years of age, he had him truly nourished so that he was fair and much. And he had never sucked other milk, but from his wife and his son he had made to be nourished by another woman. And Antor knew not which he loved better, nor did he ever call him anything but his son, and he truly believed that he was his father. At All Saints' Day, Antor made his son a knight, and at Christmas he came to Logres, as did the other knights of the land, and brought with him his two sons. On Christmas Eve, all the clergy of the realm were assembled, and all the barons who were of valour, and had done well as Merlin had said. And when they had all come, they led a simple and honest life. Thus they awaited all Christmas Eve, and were at midnight mass, and humbly prayed to our Lord, that he of his grace send them such a man who might profitably maintain them and the Christian faith. So they stayed for the mass of the day, and many said they were fools to believe our Lord would concern himself with the choosing of their king. And as they were in this conversation, they rang for the mass of the day, and so they went to service. When they were all assembled, there was one of the holiest men of the land arrayed to sing the mass. But before he went to mass, he spoke to the people and said, You are assembled for three things for your benefit, and I shall tell you what they are. First of all, for the salvation of your souls, and for the worship of God, and the miracle and high virtue that he this day shall show among us, if it be his pleasure to give us a king and chieftain who may save and maintain holy church, that is the sustenance of all true Christian people. We have come to choose one of us. We are not wise enough to know who is most profitable for all this people. And because we do not know, we should pray to the King of Kings, who is Jesus Christ our Saviour, that he show us a true sign to his pleasure as he was born on this day. So let every man pray in the best way he can. And thus they did, as the good man counseled them. And he proceeded to Mass, and he came to the Gospel and what they had offered. Some of the people went out of the church where there was an empty space. And when they came out of the church, they saw it begin to dawn and clear, and saw before the church door a great stone square, and did not know of what stone it was, but some said it was marble. And above, in the middle place of this stone, there stood a shaft of iron that was largely half a foot in height, and through this shaft was a sword fixed into the stone. When those who were first out of the church saw this, they marveled greatly and went back into the church and told the archbishop. And when the good man who sang mass heard this, he took holy water and cast it upon the shaft. And the archbishop bowed to the sword and saw golden letters in the steel. And he read the letters that said, Who takes this sword out of this stone shall be king by the election of Jesus Christ. And when he had read these letters, he said to the people what it meant. Then the stone was delivered to ten worthy men to keep, and to two clerks. Then they said that our Lord had shown them a fair miracle, and they went back into the ministry to hear out the Mass, and to yield our Lord graces. And they sang Te Deum Laudamus. And when the good man came to the altar, he turned to the people and said, Noble lords, now you may see that some of you are good men, when through your prayers and supplications our Lord has shown this great miracle. Therefore I pray and require you above all virtues in this earth, for highness nor earthly riches that God has given in this world, that none be against this election that God has shown us the demonstration, and the surplus he shall show us at his will. Then the good man proceeded with the Mass, and when it was finished they assembled around the stone, both one and another, who might take out this sword first. And then they said and agreed all that they should try it as the ministers of Holy Church would assign. There was great discord among the highest and most powerful, and those who had force said they would try first. So there were many words that ought not to be rehearsed. The archbishop spoke so that all might hear and said, Sirs, 
You are not as wise nor as well-advised men as I thought, and I want you all to know that our Lord has chosen one, but I do not know whom. And this much may I say to you, that gentleness nor richness shall have no power against the will of Jesus Christ, but trust so much in him that if he who is chosen were yet unborn, it shall never be taken out of the stone until he comes for whom it is ordained the honor. Then all the noble and wise men agreed and said that he had spoken truth. And the wise men and the high barons took their counsel and agreed to abide by the ordinance of the archbishop. And they came back and said, Hearing to all the people. And then the bishop made great joy and wept for pity and said, This humility that is in your hearts is of God, and I want you to know that my intent shall be to the will of God and the profit of Christian faith, so that I shall have no blame if God wills it. This parliament was before high mass of the assay of the sword, until that high mass was said. Then the archbishop said to the people, and showed them the great miracle that God had done for them at this election. And when our Lord set justice on earth, he set it in the anvil and in the sword, and the justice over the lay people ought to be the sword, for the sword at the beginning was given to three orders to defend Holy Church and maintain righteousness, and our Lord has now made election by the sword. And know it well, all who have seen and beheld this, to whom he will give justice. And let no man be too hasty to attempt, for it shall never be drawn out for riches or for pride, nor let the poor people be displeased though the lords and the high estates attempt first, for it is right and reasonable that the lords attempt first. For there is none of you, but he ought to have his king and his lord, the best and most worthy man that he could know by his reason. Thus they agreed to the archbishop with good heart and without ill will, that he should choose those whom he would to attempt first. Thus they all granted to hold him for their king, to whom God would grant his grace. Then the archbishop chose out 150 of the highest and most worthy lords, and made them go to the attempt. And when they had all attempted, then he commanded all others to attempt. And then they all attempted, one after another, who would attempt. But there was none who could take it out. And so it was commanded to be kept with ten noble men, and they were charged to take good heed who came to attempt, and if any there were that might draw out of the stone. Thus was the sword attempted all the eight days, and all the barons were at high mass, and the archbishop preached to them and showed as he thought best. And then he said, I told you well that all leisure might he come that was farthest from the attempt of this sword. Now you may verily know that never anyone, except he whom our Lord wills, shall it be taken out. And then they all said that they would not leave the town until they knew to whom God would grant that honor. In that manner they waited out the mass, and after they went to their hostels for food, and after meal, as they were accustomed at that time, the barons and the knights went to board in a fair plain, and the ten men who were ordained to keep this sword went also to see this sport. And when the knights had jousted a while, they took their shields to their squires, so that the people of the town went to arm them. And Antor had made his eldest son knight at the All Saints' Day before Yule. And when the melee was begun, Kay called his brother Arthur, and said, Go fast to our inn, and fetch my sword. And Arthur was good and serviceable, and said, With good will. And then he struck the horse with the spurs, and rode forth to his inn to fetch his brother's sword, or else some other, if he might find any. And he found none, for the hostess had placed it in her chamber. And so he turned to them again. And when he saw he could find none, he began to weep for great anger. And as he came before the minster where the stone was, he saw the sword which he had never attempted, and thought, if he might get it, to bear it to his brother. And as he came by there on horseback, he seized the sword by the hilt, and drew it out, and covered it with his lap. And his brother, who remained behind outside the town, 
saw him come, and rode toward him, and asked for his sword. And Arthur said he could not have it, but I have brought here another, and drew it out from under his coat, and gave it to his brother. And as soon as Kay saw this sword, he knew well that it was the sword of the stone, and thought he would be king, and said he would seek his father until he found him. And then he said, Sir, I shall be king. Look, here is the sword of the stone. When the father saw it, he marveled how he got it, and he said he took it out of the stone. When Antor heard that he did not believe it, but said he lied. Then they went to the minster where the stone was, and the other squire after. When Antor saw the stone and the sword not therein, he said, Fair son, how did you get this sword? Look, you do not lie, and if you do lie, I shall well know it, and never shall I love you. And he answered as one who was sore ashamed, I shall not tell you any falsehood, for my brother Arthur brought it to me when I asked him to go fetch mine, but I do not know how he got it. When Antor heard this, he said, Son, give it to me, for you have no right to it. And Kay delivered it to his father, and he looked behind him and saw Arthur, and called him and said, Come here, fair son, and take this sword and put it where you took it. And he took the sword and put it in the anvil, and it held as well or better than it did before. And Antor commanded his son Kay to take it out, and he tried, but it would not be. Then Antor called them both, and said to Kay, I knew well that you had not taken the sword out. Then he took Arthur in his arms and said, Fair dear son, if I might procure that you be king, what good should I have therefore? Father, said he, I may neither have that honour nor any other good, but that you be there of lord as my lord and my father. And he said, Sir, your father I am in nurture, but certainly I did never engender you, nor I know never who did engender you. When Arthur saw that Antor denied being his father, he wept tenderly and had great sorrow, and said, Fair sir, how should I have this dignity or any other when I have failed to have a father? A father you must needs have. But fair dear sir, if our Lord wills that you have this grace, and I help you to procure it, tell me what I shall be the better for it. And Arthur said, Sir, as you will yourself. Then Antor told him what bounty he had done to him, and how he had nourished him, and how he put away his son Kay, and made him to be nourished by a strange woman. Wherefore you owe to give my son and me reward, for there was never man more tenderly nourished than I have you. Wherefore I pray you, if God gives you this grace, and I may help you thereto, that you reward me and my son. And Arthur said, I pray you that you deny not me to be my father, for then I should not know where I should go. And if you may help to procure this grace, and God wills that I have it, you can nothing say nor command, but I shall do it. And Antor said, I won't ask for your land, but I'll ask this much of you. If you become king, make my son Kay your steward in such a way that he won't lose his position for any mistake he makes, whether to you or anyone else in your land. Even if he's foolish, cruel, or vile, you should tolerate him more than anyone else. So, I ask you to grant him this request. Arthur agreed willingly. Then he led him to the altar and swore to fulfill his promise faithfully. After swearing, he came before the minster, and the tournament was over, and the barons came for evening prayer. Then Antor gathered all his friends and went to the archbishop, saying, Sir, here is my son, who is not a knight, asking me to help him attempt the sword's adventure. Please call the barons. And so he did, and they assembled around the stone. Then Antor instructed Arthur to take out the sword and deliver it to the archbishop. Arthur took the sword by the hilt and gave it to the archbishop without delay. Immediately the archbishop embraced Arthur and said, Te Deum Laudamus, and brought him into the minster. 
The barons and high-ranking men who had seen and heard this were angry and sorrowful, saying it couldn't be that such a simple man of such low rank should be lord of them all. The archbishop was displeased and said, Gentlemen, our lord knows best what every man is. Antor and his friends stood by Arthur along with the common people, but all the barons were against them and against Arthur. Then the archbishop spoke with great firmness. Know that even if everyone in the world were against this election, if our Lord wills this man to be king, he will be without fail. And I shall show you how and what confidence I have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, dear brother Arthur, go put the sword back in the same place you took it from. And Arthur put the sword back in the same place, and it held as firmly as before. Then the archbishop said, Such a fair election has never been seen. Now, rich barons and lords, try if you can take out the sword. Then they all tried, but none could move it from its place. Then the archbishop said, You act foolishly to oppose our Lord's will, for now you see well how it is. And they said, Sir, we are not against our Lord's will, but it is grievous to us to have a boy as Lord over us all. And the archbishop said, the one who has chosen him knows best what he is. Then the barons asked the bishop to leave the sword in the stone until Candlemas, and by that time men from distant countries could come to attempt the adventure, and the archbishop granted this. Then men from every country came and tried, but when they had all tried, the archbishop said, Arthur, if it pleases our Lord Jesus Christ for you to be king, Go forth and bring that sword. And Arthur went to the sword and took it out as easily as if it had been holding nothing. When the prelates and the common people saw this, they began to weep for joy and pity and said, Gentlemen, is there still anyone who opposes this election? And the baron said, Sir, we ask that the sword be left in the stone until Easter, but if by then anyone comes who can take it, we will obey this, and if you won't wait that long, then everyone will do the best they can. And the archbishop said, If he waits until Easter, and no one else comes who can perform this adventure, will you then submit to this election? And they all said, Yes. Then the archbishop said to Arthur, Put the sword back in the stone, for if God wills it, you shall not fail of the dignity that he has promised you. And Arthur did as he commanded, and ten men and five clerks were appointed to guard the stone, and in this manner they waited until Easter. And the archbishop, who had taken Arthur under his wing, said, Know for certain that you will be king and lord of this people. Now, make sure you are a good man, and from now on choose counsellors and officers for your household, as if you were already king, for with God's help you shall be. And Arthur said, I put my whole trust in God and in Holy Church, and in your good counsel. Therefore choose as you see fit to the pleasure of Jesus Christ, and I ask you to call my Lord my Father. Then the archbishop called Antor and informed him of Arthur's response. They then chose counsellors as they wished, and by the counsel of the archbishop and certain barons, Kay was made steward. They waited for everything else until Pentecost, and then they assembled at Logris. When they were all assembled on Easter Eve, the archbishop led them all to his palace and recounted to them the great wisdom and good qualities he found in Arthur. The baron said, We will not oppose God's ordinance, but it is a marvel to us that such a young man and of such low birth should be lord and governor of us all. The archbishop said, You do not act as Christians to be against Christ's election. And they said, We are not against it, but you have seen his qualities, and we have not. Therefore, we ask you to allow us to know his qualities and the manner of his governance in the future. The archbishop said, Do you thus delay his coronation? And they said, We would like his anointing and coronation to be postponed until Pentecost, 
Thus we all pray and request, and the Archbishop granted it. Thus ended the council, and on the next day, when High Mass was said, Arthur went to the sword and took it out as easily as he had done before. Then they all said they would have him as their lord and governor, and they asked him to put the sword back. Arthur answered the barons very courteously, and said he would do their request, or anything else they desired of him. Then they led him into the minster to speak with him, and to test his qualities, saying, Sir, we see clearly that God wills you to be our king and lord, therefore we will pay homage to you and hold our honours from you. And we beg you to postpone your anointing until Pentecost, but you shall be our lord and king nonetheless. But to this we ask you to tell us your will. Arthur replied, I cannot accept what you say about doing homage to me and holding your honours from me, for I cannot give honours to you or anyone else until I have received mine, and as you say you want me to be lord of you and the realm, that cannot be before I am anointed and receive the honour of the empire, but the delay you desire I grant willingly, for I will not be anointed, nor anything related to it, without God's will and your consent. Then the barons said among themselves, If this child lives, he shall be very wise, and well has he answered us. And then they said, Sir, it seems to us with your advice that you should be crowned and anointed at Pentecost, and by that time we shall obey you at the command of this archbishop. Then they brought jewels and all other riches, and gave them to him to see if he would be greedy and grasping. And when he had received all these gifts, it is said he distributed them, to knights, horses, and fine robes, to those who were jovial and envious, he gave the jewels, to the greedy, gold and silver, and to wise and sober men, he gave things that he thought would please them, and he kept company with them, and asked in the country what would please them best. Thus he distributed the gifts that were given to him, to know what kind of person he would be. And when they saw him behave like this, there was no one but greatly praised him in their hearts, saying that he would be of great renown, and they could not see any trace of greed in him. But as soon as he had the great wealth, he surrounded himself with it in such a way that everyone said no one could have done better, whatever their status or rank. Thus they tested Arthur and found in him only great virtue and great discretion, and so they waited until Whitsuntide, and then all the barons assembled at Logres, and there they again tested the sword, all who wished to try, but there was never found a man who could remove it from the stone. And the archbishop had prepared the crown and scepter and all that belonged to the anointing. On Whitsun Eve, by common counsel of all the barons, the archbishop made Arthur a knight. He stayed awake all night in the chief minster until the next day. And when it was day, all the barony came to the minster. The archbishop said, Gentlemen, Behold, here is the man whom God has chosen to be your king, as you have seen and known. And behold, here is the crown and royal vestments, ordained by your advice and the common assent. And if any of you do not assent to this election, let him speak now. And they answered and said, We agree that in God's name he be anointed and crowned with this, so that if any of us have displeased him by opposing his coronation, May he forgive us all until this day. And with that they all knelt before Arthur, asking him for mercy. And Arthur, out of pity, began to weep, saying to them, May the Lord who has granted me this honour grant you pardon, and as far as it lies in me, I absolve you. And with that they rose up and took him in their arms, and led him to the royal vestments. And when he was arrayed, the archbishop was ready to sing mass and said to Arthur, Now go fetch the sword, with which you shall keep justice, defend holy church, and maintain right, and the Christian faith to your power. And so they went in procession to the stone. Then the archbishop said to Arthur, If you will swear to God and to Our Lady St. Mary, and to our Mother Holy Church, 
and to St. Peter, and to all saints, to save and hold truth and peace in the land, and to keep true justice to your power. Come forth and take this sword, by which God has made the election upon you. When Arthur heard this, out of pity, he began to weep, and so did many others. And he said, As truly as God is Lord over all things, may he, in his great mercy, grant me grace and power to maintain this, as you have rehearsed, and as I have understood it well. And then he knelt down, holding up his hands, and then took out the sword lightly without difficulty, and bore it upright. And they led him to the altar, where he laid the sword. And then they anointed and consecrated him, and did all that belonged to a king. And after all the service was ended, they went out of the minster, and came by the place where the stone was and no one could know where it had gone. Thus was Arthur chosen as king, and he ruled the realm of Logres long in peace. There you are. Thank you for listening to my story, and I hope you enjoyed it. Please tell me in the comments if you enjoy hearing these old stories, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with others. Once again, thank you for listening and I will see you all again very soon.